Hello and welcome to Podcastle in the Sky. In this episode, we'll be looking at two films from the 1990s, Princess Mononoke and Last of the Mohicans. Both films present a world in conflict between indigenous populations and more advanced societies, which are in conflict with each other as well as within themselves to some greater or lesser degrees. And we'll be looking at similarities and differences between both films. I'm William. I'm Amber. I'm Jesse. I'm Lily. And I'm Tom. All right. Just to start things off, I wanted to bring up the massively sweeping scores of both movies because, holy shit, both of them, like, it's like there's something about, you know, Grand Vistas of Forest Land, I guess, that just gets a composer going because both of them are incredibly grand. It's like you you see a sweeping shot of forest in either movie, and then it's like, you know, giant string orchestra just, like, blaring. It's amazing. Like, it's beautiful. Both scores are beautiful, and they're, again, like, just constantly coming up whenever a dramatic movie, uh, dramatic moment happens. But, and I really, now that I think about it, I should have done a little bit of research about the composers. I wondered just a, a little bit if Mononoke's composer had not been a little bit influenced by Mohicans because they were very similar in tone as well. I don't know if I, anybody noticed this. Um, but the I, uh, composer for Princess Mononoke, I believe, was Joe Hisaishi, who apparently is a big anime guy, music composer dude. Oh, absolutely. He, he's, he's famous. Okay, cool, cool. Yeah. Uh, that makes sense. Just a second. Let me, let me pull up Last of the Moon. Last. I believe you'll find it's Trevor Jones and, and some other guy. Yes, yes. Actually, you know what? I've been listening to the Last of the Mohican soundtrack on Spotify for the last couple of days. So, yeah, Trevor Jones. Yep. Tre- yes, Trevor yes. Jones and Randy Edelman. So, yeah. So, big guys there, too. So, I have to say, like, I was... I felt like both films really needed that kind of sweeping score, you know, like it kind of gave a good hearty depth to both tales and the complexity of both tales. And to be honest, it was probably the best music of anything we have watched, period, personally. Yeah. So, you know yeah. that fiddle piece in Last of the Mohicans? It's called The Gale, actually. G- yeah. G-A-E-L, not the... Not the yeah, yeah as in a, a Celtic person. I actually wanted to talk yeah. about that a bit because, you know, I didn't know the name when I was watching the movie, but it was very obviously Celtic as a theme. You know, living in Ireland, you hear a lot of Celtic and pseudo-Celtic music growing up. And so it felt about as incongruous as Daniel Day-Lewis as a Native American. You know, the most <laughs> Irish Native American this side of the film where Pierce Brosnan <laughs> played a British guy pretending to be a Native American. That's a real movie. Look it up. So... While the music was very good, it also felt a little incongruous, like the character. But when I thought about it, it was also consistent with the film, because it's it's not a movie about Native Americans, or even just about Native Americans. It's also about the colonizers and the settlers. And beyond Daniel Day-Lewis, there's a strong, specifically Scottish element to it. Like, there's a Scottish commander who's a principal character in the film. So there's kind of an odd kind of Celtic theme to it. I mean, this is the music I would really expect. If you, if you just played it to me and not told me what movie it was from, you asked me to guess, said it was a 90s movie, I would have said Braveheart, you know? <laughs> well, Yeah, I, I mean, I think both, it, sorry, both sorry. scores kind of, I mean, they're, they're sort of grandiose and instrumental, but at the same time, I mean, Mohicans more so, but even Mononoke does this a little bit. They kind of merge in either folk or folk-influenced elements, and especially, I mean, we'll talk more about the the final action sequence of Mohicans, but I think a more nor- one of the reasons I think people find that scene so memorable and like it a lot is because I think a more traditional movie would have done also a more traditional orchestral score for that action sequence, and instead it's like this kind of interesting you know, Celtic drone that goes throughout the, the scene that's really interesting. And it gives it, it it sort of elevates the material in a lot of ways. Because, I mean, I, I enjoy Last of the Mohicans a lot, but on some level it's sort of just a silly action movie. But um, the music, in particular that scene, like, it gives it this real, like, emotional mm-hmm. heft and this sort of, like, 
spirituality that it really wouldn't have without that music at all. Well, last of the yeah. Mohicans, the novel, it was uh, it was not that great. Like um, what's his name? Um, Mark Twain. Samuel Cooper. Uh, yeah, Mark Twain. He really hated the book. He wrote like his long essay ranting about how much he hated it. He was like nitpicking every single thing about it. And but I don't know. Like I think this is one of the few adaptations where the movie is better than the book. I, I would also point out though, it's not just an adaptation of the uh, book as the credits note. It's also an adaptation <laughs> of the last film made of the book, the one from 1936. As I've heard that this film, that both of these films are relatively unfaithful to the novel. Apparently, there's a BBC series which is more faithful, but also kind of ridiculous. It's because it's shot in Scotland with you know Native Americans with white people. I, I wonder what? if this <laughs> oh, is the BBC. Shit. I mean, what do you expect? Yeah, uh, yeah. But... <laughs> it was this. Also, was the 70s. It was extremely normal oh, without white oh, people. Okay, okay. Uh, anyway, yeah, that, that makes but, more sense. But, but my but point is sense. that uh, it's, it's not okay. It's just it was extremely common back then. Uh, and it was extremely common yeah. in Hollywood as well. You know, let's not let them off. Yeah. It was based on the movie, possibly more than the novel. I've not seen the previous movie or read the novel, so I couldn't say. But I think it is worth noting. I believe Mann was did, a fan of the original, well, of the earlier film. Did anyone Michael see, Mann, the director. Did some, Michael Mann, the director. Did anybody go out to uh, watch the one from the 30s? Because I was wiffle-waffling about watching that one as well as the Daniel Day-Lewis one but I never actually sat down to watch it. Yeah, I, don't, I don't think I, I hadn't picked up on the fact that there was an earlier film, honestly. <laughs> also, I, yeah, I, kind of, oh. I kind of rushed into watching Mohicans for the first time very shortly before us doing this, so I did not prepare myself. Yeah, because so I I mean, the, the original book is, there are a lot of iconic elements that have filtered their way into lots and lots of other media, but it's more, it's more of a downer. And it's also exceedingly tedious. So, <laughs> so more of a downer? Yeah, like everyone, like Cora dies a lot. Uh, it's been forever since I, and it's not, it's a tedious, boring, uh, unenjoyable read in pretty much every way. But yeah, a lot, most of the other main characters die also. Uh, uh, Roger Ebert calls it an all but unreadable book. Yeah, he's not wrong. It's <laughs> some things wow. age really well. Uh, Last and Mohicans is not one of them, but most of its ideas live on. Okay, question kind of about the, the, the book and all this stuff. And I cannot believe that I did no research on the book at all. I I feel kind of skeevy for not. But like, did uh okay? Was the book pure fiction? Or was it based on anything, like like any, uh, and I ask mostly because as a kid I was kind of fascinated by Indian tales, if you know what I mean, like the kids who were during a lot of the Indian wars, who were kind of, after their parents were slaughtered, taken in and adopted, and I was wondering if that, if the story was based on somebody who, you know, was actually adopted by no, uh, it's, uh, it's just like straight up fiction. Well, it's, what, what one mean, thing worth noting is that it's actually part of a series of novels. It was the second novel of five novels. I think you can uh-huh. some. I've not read the novels, obviously, as I've just said, but I think you can see some of that structure in the film because it's a bit like a Mad Max film in that you know it's some guy with a past wandering into someone else's story, you mm-hmm. know, and you could easily see this guy moving on to go do something else in the next book, you know. Yeah, well, that's the thing. I mean, even in the movie, like, he doesn't, the main character, Hawk, Hawkeye, doesn't, like, he's not really a character. There's nothing, like, he has no arc. He's just sort of this, like, awesome guy who can do everything and kind of just swoops in. Yeah. And his actions influence was... the actual sort of characters <laughs> around him, but, like, he's just, he's just, like, perfection front to back. Like, Okay, who 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 else... Kind of okay. I kind of laughed out loud when he had two fucking muskets in his hand. Oh yeah, yeah. That's no. possible. Yeah, no, that wouldn't have worked. That was a very Michael yeah, Mel. He's like, I was like what? <laughs> well, and that's what's funny about. I'd like to. Well, I'd like to address ahead. what you were just doing some quick research here. I'd like to address what Am- Amber was asking about. From what I from what I can see, there is no there is no like historical inspiration for the protagonist of James Cooper's <laughs> pentalogy no. of novels. The character is named Natty Bumpo in the books. Yes, I know. Uh, it's it's awful. On, but, yeah. you know, the, the historical basis is the fact that, like, it's based on actual, like, the specific military activity shown in 
involving the like the generals and the Brit and the British and French sides of their like their identities and them being involved in specific military conflict. Like those oh, are things okay. that actually happened, and that's the historical basis of it. I mean, um, let's, let's, let's be blunt here. He's really just an embodiment of a very popular fictional idea of the white person who you know gets sucked into some other culture and goes native, and in the process of going native, becomes really good at it. He's yeah, hectoring other Native okay. Americans about not being Native American enough. You know. <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah, like, uh, yeah he, he's he does the smack down on old Mogwa, doesn't he? <laughs> Well, um, Although he's not the one who kills him. Yeah, the, uh, yeah. no, no. Yeah, that, it, yeah. it is actually an appreciable. Oh no, no, no. I was, I was saying verb- verbally, verbally. Oh, yes. Sorry. Sorry. Look at you. You want to be an imperialist white man? You know, yeah. not me. <laughs> <laughs> not me. The white man adopted by Native American, <laughs> played by a European. It's it's a huge part of uh, fiction. There is also examples specifically with Native Americans in German fiction, which I feel like I'll, I'll be obliged to go into at some point. But throughout films as well, you can even say Kevin Costner's character in Dances with Wolves. I assume is like this. I've never seen the movie. I just assume this is what it's not like. Not quite. Okay. It's uh, he's, yeah, just, you know, he's less not, of a cartoon. He's yeah. not. He's yeah. also not, as far as I know, raised by the Native Americans in the no, same. No, 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 no. no. Yeah. He just he becomes. Yeah. The, the... Yeah, I was going to say a good example that I'm definite about is Kim, as in the Rudyard Kipling novel and later the film with Dean Stockwell. He's an orphan boy with Irish parents, Irish military parents. He grows up in India. He's essentially raised by the streets of India, and then he's used by the British as a kind of agent to help them do stuff. So that's a similar kind of arc. He's a guy who can exist easily within the, in the world of non-white people, but being white also gives him some certain access and abilities. So, it, And that's another, you know, old novel so it was a common idea yeah well then it's kind of it's already flirting with you know the i mean there are still lots and lots and lots of indian wars to come by the time beyond fenmore's age but still it's sort of they're not really the threat that they used to be and so it's the the element is coming up in the culture at this point that now that they're a defeated people you can sort of look at them as like it's like oh yeah you know they're savages or whatever but they're also you know so much more connected to the spiritual ah, the noble, world than the land and it's, yeah. you know it, it's it's a little more it's a little different even than that though because it's not even just that they're like the noble savage it's the the it's that they're like actually superior to you know the the, the greed and the, the, you know urbanization and all these Sup- things superior Whereas, yes but still reducing to a narrow well, yeah, it's it's still a character, but it's a different. Yeah. It's a there's a difference between like the the noble savage who helps you out and the like. We should learn with these people because they're so soulful and are one with the land. Which again, it's a character, but it's a it's this weird <laughs> nostalgia for something that never existed and stuff like that. Which is a little well, different. There's a whole again with these stolen children kind of stories, uh, which kind of started the trend. There's you know. There's actually a pretty big history of the idea of the white man, as as Will said, but even more so, it's like essential to this idea of true Americanism, a true American man who is one with the land, who can walk among those who are, like you said, better than us because they're better with the land, but he's still a white guy, so he can come back to our civilized world and teach us the true meaning of what it is to be an American man. Yeah. 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 (laughs) Yeah, Well, and you know, Daniel day Lewis's character sort of uh, embodies this, you know, like he he's with the settlers whom I feel of all the characters are probably the more sympathetic, you know what I mean? Of the movie, these guys who are, cutting out a life in the land like even the native americans for the most part have no beef with the settlers which is interesting because the settlers in history were the ones who were cutting into their land even land that had been on treaty to be their their place you know this is your place this is our place the settlers were well known to just say fuck that i i need to build my farm you know and yeah. a lot of these border disputes popped up because of that, 
you know, because yeah. of settlers not keeping with the treaty. Well, but yeah. in the movie, it's like they are they are truer Americans because they're still they're rough. They're still with the land. While well, also the in a lot of ways, like it. it's a proto American Revolution movie. Like there's a there's a dozen <laughs> scenes in this where it's like. Do you get it? This is where the ideals of the American Revolution come from. <laughs> uh, well, liberty, etc. Uh, but yeah. As far as the historical basis for Last of the Mohicans premise, I mean, this whole adoption thing, it did happen in the Eastern Woodlands, at least. I'm not sure how prevalent it was in other parts of the Americas. But I mean, basically, the indigenous population, their um, disease resistance was almost zero to like diseases from Europe and Asia like measles, smallpox, the common cold, and their mortality rates were horrific, something between 30 to 90 percent. So it was basically a post-apocalyptic society from the uh, from the point of view of the native peoples. And so a lot of them, they to keep their, their people going, they were adopting people from other tribes and even um, prisoners of war, like you saw with Magua. He was a Huron, he was captured, and he was adopted as a Mohawk basically to keep their numbers up and that is actually a realistic thing that happened and happened pretty commonly so that was not fictional but of course obviously this specific case like some guy who was a long-haired daniel day lewis killing killing his way through the um, mohawks and the hurons obviously that didn't happen <laughs> yeah, I mean, in a lot of ways, especially in the movie, it's like, I mean, it's using history as a very, very, very loose canvas, but it really is more like a, a mythological, almost, telling of American history. Like, here's the crucible of liberty, and here's the rugged outdoorsman, and here's the, I mean, the, the French guy wasn't actually a terrible human being in real life. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it, it has all these, like, classic motifs visually and story-wise of like the early frontier and, and all that and so like the and it's history adjacent really it's not it's all about like the and it is i mean this goes back to what amber was saying with the music like it's kind of, it's you know capital r romantic kind of stuff like yeah. painting in really broad strokes actually remember uh, that design. um that party at the fort where it was implied that hawkeye and cora they slept together and the uh oh when they're like um like dancing and kissing each other and then there was a scene of the sun rising it was like a scene straight out of the cover of a romance novel <laughs> and, and I mean, his... there were even <laughs> billowing shirts <laughs> yeah no his whole character like he's got the open shirt the long the long billowing hair um you know hair the hair that matches hers you know there yeah he's a hunky mountain dude who will talk to you about stars i mean what more do you want <laughs> Come on. True. Oh, if only I had a Daniel Day Lewis of my own. Mm. <laughs> I mean, that's the thing. Well, the last one he gets is a weird movie because it's constantly vacillating between. Um, and I love it for both reasons. It like prestige picture and like schlock. <laughs> like it's it's constantly that you know because you have like gorgeous cinematography. Really, it must have been absurdly expensive. Like. Yeah, those, those. Uh, that fort, they actually built a fort in, like, North Carolina or something. And then they were, like, getting input from historians, like, this is the kind of wood you should use, whatever, whatever. And then after they were done, they demolished everything and replanted over it. And yeah. the entire huh. time, I was asking myself, how the hell did Michael Mann get a budget for this? This is, this is like, a massive movie. I was thinking, like, I, like, I don't think this would get made <laughs> now. I think people would be like, there's no market for this. It made me a little sad, because, like, the, the forts, it's really, it looks so good. Like, the the money shows on the screen. Like, it's a great like, movie. I guess think about think about the context of the early 1990s. Like, if, if this was ever going to get green lit, it makes sense that it happened, like, in the time right after Dances with Wolves, which was yeah. an hour longer, came out and won Best Picture. Yeah, that's true. But, yeah, uh, like... The it was also before, you know, CGI started replacing everything. I mean, if they made it this today, there'd be a lot more CGI, and mm -hmm. that entire set would probably be mostly CGI or oh, yeah. a bigature or something. Well, I, more I like, also like, think that, you know, like, eras of what constitutes a movie that will become a blockbuster also just kind of change, you know? In the 90s, there were this huge thing of, like, historical 
blockbusters. I yeah, mean, come on, uh, like Braveheart letter. was fucking huge. Yeah, so. notoriously yeah. terrible. Uh, Scarlet Letter. Patriot. That man. <laughs> I, I uh, the Patriot. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, the Patriot. Yeah. yeah. The pa- the Patriot was kind of possibly like the last gasp of that like era. But, <laughs> yeah. Because uh, I was uh, going back to what I was saying though. So yeah, you have all these like prestige elements like the sets and the, the nice costumes. But then, like we said earlier, you have Daniel Day Lewis dual wielding muskets and like you know the campy dialogue and it, it, yeah, it's it's a very Michael Mann. Michael Mann in period clothes movie, and I mean I enjoy it for that reason, not partially, but it is it's a strange creature. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Okay. Can can I bring up just to link over to Princess Mononoke for a second? I really enjoy that in both movies. There's no, to me anyway, real villain. Like I guess Mago is as close as you can get in Dances with Wool. Or, sorry, <laughs> in uh, <laughs> Eakins and the the priest who took the head for a mm. bit, maybe in Mononoke, but yeah, G- everybody Gico in or Iboshi or yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there's Every, no villain. <laughs> yeah, everybody has like a sympathetic like how they got here and why they want what they want. And personally, I think Magua's like revenge thing is totally like I I don't blame him. You know, I mean, if we were following him, we would have probably been, like, all over that shit. You know, like, yeah, kill that goddamn officer who killed your entire family. We're good with that. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. the only reason he's the villain in this movie is because he's going to kill our love interest, mm-hmm. you know? So. No, I'd, I'd argue that Magra, you know, is probably, yeah, generally pretty valid. The movie does not try to frame him like that, though. Nah. They push... No. Nah. They push really hard, as as William mentioned earlier. We have a whole. Uh, we have Daniel D. Lewis again, the the white man who's better at being a native than the natives, dressing him down for just everything in the climax. And my God, is that <laughs> that toad death scene? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one reason I think that there's relative lack of villains in these films is because of the sense of a vast conflict happening that's much more above them. Mm-hmm. Like in The Last of the Mohicans, it's the Seven Years' War. And it could be easy to forget just how large that war was. Some people argue it should be considered the First World War, because while it was fought in the Americas, it was also fought in Europe, and it was fought in India, and there was a brief amount about of it in West Africa, because Britain and France were at war, and they had global empires, so that impacted everywhere where they interacted, which was quite a few places. Can I cut it for just a second, Will, just to say uh, my American centricism makes me forget all the time that the French and Indian War was part of the Seven Years' War, and that is very, very sad. Now continue. Let me just put this in a context that I think everyone can appreciate. It's the same war that Barry Lyndon fights in the movie Barry Lyndon, okay? This is literally the same conflict. So there's that kind of broad conflict way beyond everyone else, up in the distance, the monarchs of Britain and France, the overchieftains, which do not appear in the film and cannot be reasoned with. And in Mononoke, it's the more fictional but still epically mythological struggle of gods and death and time and forces that no one really fully understands how they work. And there's also the the emperor somewhere far away who is trying to get immortal – and he's willing to kill an entire forest to do it, apparently. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and there's also the same kind of, it also sets up the same tensions. People who should be on the same side also kind of aren't. So mm-hmm. there's the people on the Japanese side in Mononoke who are either working for the emperor or are working against the emperor or think they're kind of working for him. There's a tension between the people living on the frontier and the people deeper inland, which is similar to how Mohicans frames the tension between the colonials living in the frontier, and the British, who are, you know, like the Japanese samurai. They don't really get it, what's going on here out in the frontier. Yeah, they're kind of just reaping what the land has, as opposed to actually living upon it and working it. So in both films, you have the native groups. They really get the land, the Ainu and the Native Americans. And then you have the frontiers people who have better technology and are kind of using the land in a different way, but are using the land in a way that's still aware of what the land is. And then you have the more distant groups, the powerful groups, the lords and the emperors and so on, who have no real interest in the land and are just kind of charged in for some distant goal that's very above everyone's heads. I thought it was interesting how closely these elements of these two films tracked with each other 
because I never thought that we'd have such an interesting connection. In fact, even in both films, there is a principal character who is raised by some other culture. Although in the case of Mononoke, she was raised by wolves, not by Native Americans. I'm not trying to equate Native Americans to wolves. I'm just saying in both cases, they're raised by someone outside of their society. Yeah, that was pretty good. Yes. I do just want to mention something about Princess Mononoke. The movie kind of presents Lady Iboshi as this revolutionary person who's turning over the social order. Like, prostitutes can work in factories now, and the menfolk have to just stand there and take it while they are made fun of. But I do have to point out that in the end, she was still the feudal overlord. I mean, she the movie shows her sacrificing her own men as part of some political deal. So basically, it's this revolution that she was symbolizing was kind of cosmetic, that uh, there was some shuffling in the lower classes, but she still has absolute authority, and she's still ordering men to die according to her political goals. It's actually kind of similar to the British over in Last of the Mohicans. They had their own goals, the Frontiers people had their own goals, but the Frontiers people basically had to suck it up and take it. Yeah, I mean, I think she's a more... She is similar in some ways. She's a more interesting character in terms of than, you know, the British and Mohicans, because there's not really... The British and Mohicans are very much just sort of... um, they're villains or doofuses, basically. But um, with Iboshi, I think what Mononoke does better in some ways is communicating sort of the actual stakes of the frontier in a way that's disconnected from the, the war proper. Because the thing with Iboshi is that she is sort of this, like, proto... <coughs> not communist, but sort of like that. She's a modernizer, a modernist, bringing progressive ideas to feudal japan basically yeah but she's uh, kind of proto meiji might be a term to use you know she's kind of like the meiji restoration competing way earlier than it did well the meiji yeah. restoration was actually pretty conservative the, the whole point of it was to kill foreigners that's how it started it's basically saying we need to arm up so we can kill foreigners more and drive them out so it's not really japan being a liberal progressive it was about them yeah. taking control of their country from these awful foreigners. Yeah, Rivera the, well, the Emperor mean, like, expelled the invader yeah. and all that. Yeah. But anyway. Yeah. But yeah. It's not like she's like uh, very liberalizing in a lot of ways, you know. To a point. But yeah, a point, the, yeah. the thing is, though, I think what you're supposed to see in her is there's um, there's always sort of the, the sacrifices she's making for political deals still in some ways are buttressing the security of her community. And I think that's what separates her from, like, the the distant sort of the emperor or something who's doing something purely for personal ends, whereas she sort of has this, uh, a wider vision in terms of, and that's why the people, because almost everyone in the movie that lives in the town responds to her positively. They all love her. And I think part of that is because, you know, her system is still sort of rooted in this hierarchy, but if you put into it, you're, you're getting a, you know, security out of it, whereas in the... And I guess in The Last of the Mohicans, it's kind of like the, the system is falling apart because that's not there anymore. The British don't bother to help the colonists. And that's where the phrase and the relationship between the center and the periphery start showing. Um, returning back to gender, I mean, Princess Mononoke, obviously there's some strong female characters in there. But Last of the Mohicans, there are, two, <laughs> there are only two female characters. But it does show kind of that they were both... They were strong in their own ways. I mean, Korra, obviously, she was the, uh, she, she picked up a pistol and shot a Huron in the head. But her sister, too, her journey from, like, this fragile flower into what she ended up with in the end, it was happening in the background, but it was kind of interesting. Because in the beginning, she was this naive girl. And in the end, she killed herself as a final act of defiance to her enemy, to Magua. And what was really fascinating about that to me was Mago was unable to appreciate it. That uh, you can see the look on his face when she threw herself off a cliff. I mean, from her point of view, it was she was showing her defiance. But from his point of view, he was like his face, like the hell was that about? It's like <laughs> he didn't understand anything. Yeah, no, I was I always thought that it was a good little wordless character moment. Like he can't he can't quite comprehend it. What was going on? It was. It was... But yeah, obviously, um, Last of the Mohicans, it's more 
historically-ish, because obviously neither of the two women are going to become wolf princesses or anything like that. Whoa! <laughs> well, that, that, I don't know. I mean, it's not really clear what happens in the movie with Cora and... Um... They go to Kentucky and start a nice family. Yeah, but, you know, they go, they go to Kent- Kentucky to uh, <laughs> presumably live with Native Americans, you know? So it's not she's not a wolf princess. Again, I'm not equating them. But there's a sense that her arc is kind of about shedding the kind of strict British life behind. You know, there's a line where she's talking to Daniel Day-Lewis, and he's talking about, you know, the freedom of the frontier and all that, not having to live by these laws and this inexplicable white man logic. And, and she kind of feels the appeal to a certain extent. I don't know. Like, I'm iffy with the Cora character, mostly because she's a very 90s version of a strong female character, or early 90s, I would say. It's sort of like this idea of... Uh, well, first of all, it was a man who freed her from her mind shackles, which is fairly typical of the time period. Like, it's like she needed a man to come and say, you know, show her there's another way, you know, than what you do. And, um, you know, uh, I guess her <coughs> Duncan. But again, like, that was, again, because Daniel Day-Lewis came into her life, you know. And another thing is, like, she's a, she's a tough hardy woman who still needs to be saved, you know? Like, that's her whole story, is she is just constantly being saved. And I'm not saying that's not necessarily historically accurate. I mean, obviously, a British woman of rank back then would not be just like the rootinest, tootinest lady <laughs> in the land. But it's, it's not, it, it's just... Uh, very typical of the kind of strong lady character. Like, we'll make the lady strong, but not too strong, you know? Yeah. And Mononoke obviously goes a totally different direction. I mean, you've got the princess herself, who is just a firecracker, and (laughs) then you've got the lady, who is running this huge operation and keeping roving samurai at bay and balancing the emperor's needs with the forest who is constantly attacking her, you know, and she's got all of her women whom she's freed from basically sexual slavery, you know, and these are these, these women, or even just a small moment, like when the demon was first attacking the village and what do those three, what, what happens? Like three women who are fleeing, and the demon's coming by, and one girl, she just pulls out her fucking sword. You know, she is going to fight this asshole, you know. And that is cool. Like, just this tiny little moment of a woman who would stand her ground, you know. And so Mononoke's female characters are just vastly more three-dimensional. Yeah, than, I, yeah. You know, I completely well, I mean, with you, Amber. Um, yeah, Iboshi is... Pretty much my favorite part of the film. Like it in the strong sh- in strong sense, she's probably she is very arguably the main villain. She is the most prominent, but she's also extremely rich and complex and sympathetic. And you know, at the end of the film, she's framed as being a part of the positive movement forward. And as you say, yeah, you have a through line of just how they handle even the most the more minor women characters. Also, I feel like we're forgetting a great main women character. Morrow, the wolf. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, it's easy to forget because it's just it's a wolf with Gillian Anderson's voice. Uh, yeah, but but she's, I would argue, she's also a very, a very a compelling character, who, and who is, you know, like the princess herself. She is, she is aimed directly against Iboshi, and they have, they're just very, it's very powerful in how you have the sense of these strong personalities bouncing off each other and yeah. her, her biting off, off Iboshi's arm. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, to a certain extent, it comes out of the fact that Mononoke is just, I mean, it's richer in terms of character work, just from top to bottom, is oh, yeah. more textured and more interesting. Yep. Everyone yep, yep, in true. Last of the Mohicans is an archetype. Like I said, literally, yeah. the only characters in Last of the Mohicans that even have, like, an arc are Korra and Duncan, and it's ex- they're both extremely basic arcs, like, the, the least amount of movement possible. There's really nothing to those characters, and that's yeah. not even really a criticism, because, I mean, it kind of is, because 
the movie is sort of it's a shallow it's sort of a shallow movie intellectually but But it's also a sweeping melodrama so like those stock characters work fine when mohicans achieves a degree of profundity it is in when that when when that sense of the sweeping melodrama crystallizes in the climax first of all you just have great action work by man obviously but also just this like that you you get a sense of power and just the the over the overwhelming nature of it this entire like yeah. everything well, goes the- to shit sequence of woman throws herself off the cliff and all this and magua gets his guts torn out by the older name man and you just it just all this all this just vicious conflict leaving our three quote unquote heroes just sitting there on the cliff contemplating what comes next yeah well i mean because yeah. last of the week is a movie that i absolutely adore 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 when no one in it is talking <laughs> like, like, because like, yeah, the, uh, you know the the scene after they leave the fort with the ambush, like, amazing, such a well staged scene with like the the crane shot where it pans up wide and you see all the Native Americans pouring out of the sides of the forest and then I guess all enveloped in smoke, like really great shot, great sense of tre- creeping dread. All the fort stuff at night looks gorgeous. The last twenty minutes, uh, the action scene on the cliff, like almost. Basically, no dialogue, all music, all action, fantastic. And then, uh, and then inevitably, someone opens their mouth, and it's like, cl- cliche, cliche, cliche. Um, <laughs> and it, it breaks the spell a little bit. But um, whereas in Mononoke, like, there's a lot of really good character moments being traded every time people speak, and you know, the, there's a really fun conversation right before um, Ashitaka leaves the cave, and Moro's be kind of like tough mob and try and talk about ripping his head off, but there's sort of other ideas merged into there. A lot of really nice stuff that's not in Mohicans because they're, on that level, they're very different movies. Yeah. I do have to mention in Mononoke, though, that it does traffic in this stereotype of the indigenous being more supernatural or being more magical or something, that Ashitaka is less civilized, therefore, obviously, he's more in tune with nature or something. Yeah, but... Ashitaka is explicitly cut off from society as part of a people that were supposed to have been dead for centuries. Sure, yeah, no, it's archetypal. I would just argue that the framework is a bit more complex. Well, it's not like his people were, like, real. I mean, there was just real Ainu, but I don't think it's specific people. No, they never say Ainu. Yeah. The movie no. calls them the Amishi, specifically. They're, well, yeah, those were real people, fiction. actually. Are they? Yeah, I yeah I I thought them as a fictionalized parallel to the I knew, but that would also be. I think they're a subset of I knew like people who aren't quite I knew. But in any case, I I just looked it up and yeah, uh, yeah it's are, believed it might have been related to the I knew. Uh, they aren't extinct people, so we're looking at something I knew adjacent. Anyway, um, I I think we should actually explain what the I knew are. Basically, they're the um people. Who were living in Japan before later waves of colonization from Korea and from China. So they're kind of the Japanese version of the Native Americans, basically. Yeah. And I mean, there's similar stuff there, because it's not as prominent an element as in Last of the Mohicans, but there is a sense that they are dying out, and obviously, historically, that is what happened. So it sounds like. Uh, so there's. And, and, uh, this what is not the only. People from the mainland coming onto smaller islands and just fucking their shit up. That's just. just need that land. I, I can relate to that a lot. I can relate to that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but another thing, here, here's a fun fact that you, that you might not know is that Unforgiven, the uh, Clint Eastwood movie, was remade in Japan with Ken Watanabe in the Clint Eastwood role. And uh, they decided that for the purposes of this movie, the Ainu would serve the role of the Native Americans. So we're not the first person to make this connection. So there's no fact. For you anime people out there who might be interested in more, like, fictionalized thematic explorations of the experiences of the Ainu, Full Metal Alchemist, both the source material and and the other version of the anime, touch on that thematically. Um, The Ainu are still around, kind of. I mean, but Right, the Ainu are, but the the people in Mononoke aren't. Yeah, the, the Amishi aren't around, but yes, the Ainu are still around. They're still a recognized indigenous group in Japan. Yes, the Ainu like are around, around, but of course they've survived, much like, you know, all the other various indigenous groups and nations, they have survived a lot of awful shit, <laughs> especially in yeah. the 1930s, specifically for the Ainu. Yeah, 1930s, not, not a great decade in general, it has to be said. What uh, what, what what was going on during the 30s? That made, oh, no, no, oh, right, that... But, 
Imperial Japan. Huge. Uh, you know. Oh, also, yeah, racism was, was really was really in vogue, and in Japan, as I understand, it was kind of this hierarchical system of different Asian groups. Yeah, depending on where they were in the empire, and sometimes depending where they were conquered. Like northern Chinese people were above southern Chinese people because they had the northern Chinese people in the Japanese empire for longer. Oh, Japan. <laughs> oh, actually, let's just say oh, uh, imperialism. Let's. Oh, imperialism, yeah. because we're all oh, talking about. Mohicans and has a lot yeah. of roots, stuff that went bad, and it's really about the idea of the vanishing Native Americans. Well, let's be blunt: who made the Native Americans vanish? Well, who did that? Yeah. One thing to circle back: an idea that I was just thinking about is that my favorite characters in both films are admittedly a little atypical. I liked Mugwa the most in uh, Last of the Mohicans, and in Mononoke, I liked Okoto the most. And it's interesting to me because, in some ways, they're similar because. They're not really looking for anything other than vengeance. Okoto knows that uh, he's the boar god. He's the head of the boar people after the boar god is killed at the start of the movie. He knows that going to war may be foolish and will probably doom his people, but it's what he must do, and it's what he's going to do. He's blinded by everything except rage. But there's a, there's a kind of dignity to that, even as he charges to his death, even as he convinces himself that his people are still alive after they've all been killed. There's something tragic about it. I think that some of the similar with Mugwa, he's consumed by rage. His family is gone. His children are gone. His wife is remarried. There's no indication that he's going to remarry. There doesn't seem to be, for his character, a, a clear plan about what he does when he's killed Greyhair and Greyhair's daughters. He may not have a plan. He may be okay with dying himself, even with all the importance he leaves on continuing his line. He feels like a man that's kind of cut off from who he wants to be. And both of these characters make choices that doom them, but which are also choices that for them are really the only choices they can make because of who they are. Uh, both of those characters are played by very excellent character actors who el- who would argue, certainly at least the Mohicans, arguably elevate the material. You've got Wes Studi, who is, you know, kind of a staple of when you need a, a Native American guy. And in the case of both, you have both versions of the, of the Mononoke performance with Keith David, especially in the dub, just giving a lot of weight and pain to uh, to the Latoko's last moments. It always punches me in the gut because there's this moment that he had succeeded on some level. You know, that he will meet the dear God with his warriors, you know, and I don't know, there's there's something about that inevitability of his turning into a demon from his despair that always kicks me in the gut. Oh, I, I thought it was kind of funny. It was kind of implied or maybe not implied, but accidentally that the forest spirit was also Jesus because he was walking in water. And at the end, he cured a leper. <laughs> I didn't even think of that. <laughs> yeah. I was looking it up since Lily was talking about the uh, actors that played it. Because uh, I've only ever seen Mononoke in the Japanese dub, so I was curious who played Kuro in that. And it's Hisaya Morishige, who has a pretty enviable CV. He appeared in both the Yezujiro Ozu film and in a film by Kon Ichikawa. And people who are familiar with Japanese cinema outside of anime will probably recognize those names. So he did very well for himself. He did a lot of films, like over 200 in his long career. So, yeah. And he's very good, I think, in, in Mononoke. Oh, yeah. Like, deep, uh, I, basso profundo voice, you know? I had, I had watched, when I originally watched Mononoke, I watched the American dub, but I actually watched the sub this time around, and I felt that all of the voice actors really were on their A-game. So I, I recommend the sub for anybody who hasn't seen it yet. I, I think that the American dub is perfectly fine, too. I think very highly of both. I, yeah. I, like, I think the one thing with the dub is, like, Jada Pinkett Smith is a little distracting. Like, I enjoy your performance, but at the same time, like, you can you can recognize <laughs> a certain something that may feel a little out of place in 1300s Japan. Um, <laughs> one of the problems I had with watching both movies was I've seen them both so many times. It's kind of hard to be analytical about it because it's when I'm watching it, it's like, it's like, how many times have I seen this? I could quote this scene over and over again. This is only the second time I think I've ever seen Mohe- Mohicans. Like, I saw it when I was a kid a long time ago, and I remember being totally bummed out when the sister threw herself off the cliff. Like, what? What? You know, like, <laughs> but yeah. as, a, as an adult, like, I can get, I got the power of that move mm-hmm. a lot more than when I was a child watching it. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't know okay, in a decade, actually, <laughs> I realized, because I'd watched it dozens and dozens of times in high school, or 
middle school, middle school, high school, whatever it was. And then for whatever reason, I just hadn't got around to watching it again until now. And I was thinking about it. I was like, yeah, it's been, it's been like 10 years since I watched this movie. So it was good to force myself back uh, into it with fresh eyes. I actually remembered almost everything. But um, yeah, it was nice to revisit. Uh, I'd actually never seen Last of the Mohicans before, except for one scene. You see, when I was doing American history in college, my lecturer on two occasions showed clips from movies to complain about them. You know, to talk about what they got wrong, the sense of mythology they're creating, and so on, and all these inaccuracies. And one of the films he showed a clip from was Glory, and the other one was Last of the Mohicans. So I saw that clip. He ripped the piss out of it, and I then had basically no interest in ever seeing the film again until it was selected for this. And I actually quite enjoyed it. Uh, which uh, which so, scene was it? Uh, yeah. It was the battle, the battle scene. You know when they're butchering the British? Oh. Yeah, I think it was specifically the, the two musket bit, to be honest with you. Oh, okay. We'll see. Yeah. Okay. I'm totally yeah, no, but he also, he also had some issue with, uh, I think, how the Indians were dressed or something, but I honestly don't remember what his criticisms were. You know, actually, the biggest criticism historically that I have with the movie, not that I am like a – it wouldn't be anything with the battles because I am not anywhere near versed, well-versed on the French and Indian War, but the accuracy was insane. That mm. There's just oh, yeah. a fucking way that they would be sharpshooting like that. Yeah, they were ridiculously good and with those guys. It's because Daniel Day-Lewis in this movie is a Superman who does everything perfectly. <laughs> well, they do mention that he has a special rifle, the long rifle, that's, the which long is apparently rifle. his nickname. Uh, <laughs> yeah, he's oh, pretty much oh, a superhero. I mean, a spiral rifle, like, way before its time. It's, it's God, you know, God bless Daniel day <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I... I had never seen Mohicans before, as we were talking about, I think, before we started recording. I I had heard the climax of the film hyped up by a lot of older film nerds, but otherwise did not know that much about the movie. It was okay. <laughs> I mean, like, I, like I said, I have a lot of... I was affected by the finale, but otherwise wasn't especially into it, and this is the third time I've now seen Mononoke. It's one of my favorite Miyazaki's. And I'm asking, I'm getting it for Blu-ray this year, actually. <laughs> I'm actually a little bit disappointed in, there There was a lot about Bohicans that I did enjoy, mm. but the flatness of the characters kind of dragged me out a few times. Like, I know that they're all archetypes, and they really do kind of sweeping, epic kind of feel. But, you know, when, for instance, Duncan died, I felt nothing. Nothing. You is know? that the guy that gets burned on the... Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, he oh, was yeah. kind of a jerk during the Dart movie, so I, I can get Well, yeah, but it wasn't even just, like, it wasn't even his jerking. Like, like I think in some other movie, I would have felt like, you know, oh, he turned. Okay. I, I mean, like, he was a jerk, so I don't mind him dying, but he was, he, he, in the, yeah, in this movie, I was more of like, well, you know, uh, he was a guy. Well, he's kind of like, you almost feel bad even for the character because you don't really care about him that much. But uh, yeah. like the idea of the character, the abstract, it's like you really only need to die at the end of the movie so that her and Daniel Day-Lewis can get together without feeling bad at all. Like you just need to be out of the picture so well, we're going to have you nobly kill yourself. He, he, there was, yeah. I, now that I think about it, it's like he really didn't have a real purpose. Well, literally his only purpose is like... Uh, except the, for... She's, he's what she's him. escaping with Daniel Day-Lewis, yeah. like the boring, stuffy, which, again, it makes me feel he's, a little uh, bad for him. Cause he's, he's, like, like the, he's like the British guy in Pirates of the Caribbean. Uh, yeah. who uh, Kira Knightley is supposed to marry, but instead she goes off with Orlando Bloom. Oh, yeah. like, I mean, it, it's a romantic triangle, essentially, and he's, yeah. he's the Paul... Well, I won't say Paul Henry, because, of course, you know, at the end of Casablanca, she goes with Paul Henry. But he's, he's just kind of this stiff she's supposed to be with, and she doesn't really want. What I do like about him, though, is that there's all these moments where you think he's finally, you know, going to be a decent person. He's finally going to raise to the occasion a little bit, and oh, then, and he, then doesn't. he doesn't. Ask, well, yeah. <laughs> so it's like, okay, come on, <laughs> confirm that this was a Huron War party. And you see in his eyes, he's like, there's this thing I should do. I should rise to the occasion. But on the other hand, I want to be a shit. Yeah. <laughs> that's, 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 that's why I almost felt bad for him, because it's like my his entire purpose in the movie is just to, like, to be this, like, he has no chance. Like, there isn't a triangle here. He's just... Oh, no, not he's at all. Just, 
<laughs> He's just there to like add unnecessary <laughs> tension to the story. It's extremely slanted. To take like we we need somebody to jail Daniel Day Lewis, even though it doesn't really make any sense. Uh, this guy, like, <laughs> you know, to take, Left to take this. She when he originally asked for the hand in marriage, you know, it wasn't even like a sense of duty or anything. I was like, oh, oh, uh, well. You know, I don't want to ruin a great friendship, you know? (laughs) To take this to a more, uh, back to a more broader framework for a moment, if there was, if there was something that we've seen previously on the show that I would compare Mohicans most closely to, it would probably be the Untouchables. Oh, yeah. (laughs) That's very fair. Very fair. Yeah. Yeah. And that's for better and worse. For me, probably mostly for worse. <laughs> but I, um, that doesn't I, speak for everyone. I do have to point out something about character depth because I'd like to point out that we keep discussing Daniel Day Lewis and we never have called him by his character's name. So we're basically just oh, seeing yeah. Daniel Day Lewis running around with long hair and with Well no, we call him Hawkeye sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Would you rather? No, I mean, his, his name is Nathaniel, and I think I'm the first oh, person right. to say it. I think we, we even said the, okay. na- the name of the character beforehand, you know, Nanny Bumpu. I, yeah. I don't understand why they changed that. Okay. But, his, but like, uh, <laughs> like Tom was saying, his character is so thin that he's basically hmm. just the actor. Yeah. yeah, yeah Which yeah. is funny because I know before this movie came out, there was, because, you know, Daniel Day Lewis is like a famous for his method stuff, and, you know, he he wore his clothes and trapped game and stuff and it's like you know i like this movie but was it really worth it for this no <laughs> i think he carried like the rifle around everywhere for like a month so it, yeah it's <laughs> obvious that he he's familiar with the rifle or something but yeah <laughs> okay so uh, um well what did you all think of what we watched did we already say go to order Let's start with william and then we'll do the we'll start we'll end as we start that yeah. can be a new thing. Sure, why not? Uh, so yeah, um, see, so yeah, I'd seen Mononoke before, and in this case, I saw it theatrically because they did a Ghibli reshowing of all their films this year. So my most recent seeing of the film was at that. And if you can't see it theatrically, do. And if you can't, rent it or stream it or whatever is available because it's just a really good movie. It was a major milestone for anime as a, one of not just one of Miyazaki's greatest films, but one of the films which helped popularize Miyazaki as a director. Its success and its importance is one of the reasons Spirited Away got that Academy Award you might have heard about. Mm-hmm. So it's a big film. It's an important film, but also it's just a really good film. It's a film of astonishing visual ingenuity. It's a film with a strong and complicated and unusual story and striking characters. And we've been talking a lot about that we like it, so we're recommending it. And admittedly, you've probably already seen it. If you listen to this podcast, but if you haven't, you know, it's, it's worth checking out. Flash the Mohicans, which of course, as I said, I've never seen before, it's pretty good. If you like big, sweeping, epic movies, epic, romantic films, huge, gasping shots of the skyline and the hills and characters who are admittedly a little thin somewhere in there, it'll it'll do the business. You like films with big <laughs> battle sequences, it's got those too. It's it's pretty well worth watching. Now, I didn't say this until now, but I actually watched one of the director's cuts of the films, which adds a couple of minutes. I wouldn't know which minutes, but it's not a huge difference in terms of running length. I presume it's not actually a huge difference in terms of the film. So, you know, just pick whatever version you feel like there. But, you know, it's probably worth checking out if listening to this, you still think it sounds interesting. But if this isn't your thing, you know, maybe not. That's my feeling. Um. Okay, I find that I, I consider... Princess Mononoke to be one of those essentials, you know, mm-hmm. like not just of anime, but of any kind of animated. If you like animated film, you really ought to see it, not just because it was super influential, but just because it's so rich. And while I was watching it, uh, the richness, it's it's it comes out in many ways. It's not just even the characters writing it, the sweeping animation. Da, 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 da. They have these brilliant, tiny little moments that that suck you in and make the world more real. Like when, uh, I'm going to mispronounce his name, Ashitaka. Is that his name? Mm-hmm. Okay. When Ashitaka first falls off the scout tower and the demon attacks, they animated him stringing his bow, which I, I thought that was so cool. Just like they have this little moment, like he would have lost his string. So they have him stringing his bow like they gave a shit enough to think about that. Or when he goes up on the roof, he scrabbles a bit and he breaks through some slats at some point. Just little tiny moments of making the character seem to truly move through real space, which 
when you're watching an animated movie, I consider that to be incredibly in- essential, you know, because <laughs> animation oftentimes, if you skip those things, I think a lot of, I think people who aren't fans of animation, it's because they skip stuff like that because you can, you know, because you're not working with real people and it takes people out of the mood. I think some people who can't suck in to animation, it's because they miss, they miss moments they don't even realize they're missing that make the characters feel real, you know? So it's an essential movie. Last of the Mohicans I don't think is essential. I think that if you like the 90s sweeping epic historical movie with the archetypes and so on, totally watch it. It does have some great scenes like the battle scene that was mentioned before and stuff like that, like just moments that are pretty cool. But personally... It's not a movie after having seen it that I feel I I didn't feel seeing it as a grown up that it was a movie that I had missed out on. Yeah. Okay. Um, Princess Mononoke. It's kind of hard to discuss it because you all <laughs> mentioned how great it is. I do just uh, want to point out though, like in terms of story, like the main action, it just takes place over a few days, but it doesn't really feel rushed. It's uh, it's an entire story, like boom, boom, boom. And that's actually pretty hard to do, to tell a complete story within just two hours. Like, if you just put it down on paper, that's not even a novel. It's 200 pages, basically. Uh, I think that would be 200 pages. So that's like a pamphlet, basically. But when you combine everything, when you combine the writing, the story, the voice acting, the animation, it just... It just produces something that is a lot bigger than its components. And yes, I would agree with Amber. It is an essential for the anime fan. Last of the Mohicans, as I mentioned, I've seen it a lot of times. Like, I would estimate it probably at least 20 times by now. And like, uh, growing up, my brother and I would quote it to each other because, you know, it, it's so cheesy. It's, it's perfectly quotable. It's like, uh, the, the the lines that they're spouting it's so it's so stereotypical but so so um it's very blunt there you go they they say what they're feeling right then and there and it it's it's enjoyable in that way and yes it is very sweeping the action is is good it's hard to discuss it to describe something in words that you're seeing because uh well a picture is worth a thousand words so if your interest is just peaked a little bit, just give it a watch yourself and see exactly what the hell we're talking about. Um, I pretty much said my piece on both of these films. I'll just add a couple of things. Mohicans, yeah. If you're at all considering watching the movie, we'll watch the last 20 minutes or so and leave it at that. <laughs> and Mononoke is just, I mean, yeah, I, I, I've made my feelings on this film very clear, I think. And I, I'll just say that I think it's like in the in these sort of archetypal subgenre of these nature versus industry, native versus quote unquote civilized type films. Mononoke okay, is just what absolute best that you can get. Simple as that. Yep. Uh, I mean, I think everyone's pretty much covered why Mononoke okay is a fantastic movie. It's just gorgeous, intelligent, everything you want. And with Last of the Mohicans, I think I would recommend it to people in particular who like visually lush movies, because I think more than anything else, that's what it does. For all the, I'd probably be a lot harsher on the shallow characterization and really uh, campy dialogue if the movie didn't look so damn beautiful most of the time. Um, you know, if you if you just made this a long, you know, two-hour music video, it'd probably be great. And so it it's kind of it's a historical turn your brain off movie. You know, watch it, take in how lush and melodramatic it is, and then go and listen to the soundtrack in your own time. That's what I would recommend. Uh, just some things I, I want to say. First, I want to apologize that I promised I'd bring up German westerns, but there never really was a good time for it. Maybe in a subsequent podcast because it's an interest of mine for some reason. I would also like to say that Lily's comment about animals versus people. And, you know, nature versus man made made me think of the film The Birds. 
<laughs> I, I feel I just I, I feel like I have to I have to get my licks in there and I have one other lick I want to get in is that Colomini is credited for Last of the Mohicans but virtually everything with him in the movie is cut he's one of the officers that is killed very early in the movie by Mugwa when he wipes out Duncan's unit and that's un- unforgivable you can't cast Colomini and then cut him out of the movie I mean that, that's not on yeah, I know. Like, I, I saw his name in the credits. Like, what? Uh, Chief O'Brien? Where was he? I was really excited that I saw Jared Harris's name. I did not recognize him in the movie. I'm just so, so happy and proud that you got Hitchcock and your Irishness in Under the Wire. <laughs> yep. I didn't even know it was Jared Harris. So there's a lot of Irish people. Well, okay, Jared Harris is not Irish. His dad's Irish. That's close enough for me. Alrighty, we all set. Actually, Amber, I thought you were going to be introducing the next movie. Oh, yes. Okay. I will yes. watch the next movies. Okay. Next time, we'll be talking about Tank Girl and Fooly Cooly. Two movies about, uh, let's just say random wackiness. <laughs> For now, we have more to say than just that. <laughs> I'm real excited. <laughs>